All right, good morning to you all. All right, it's good to have you here. Thank you for coming. Our church supports missionaries throughout the world. This letter that I got in the email, it says this, when Joe Hyona was growing up in North Korea, the word faith meant being loyal to the king, the Kim family dictators. Religious freedom doesn't exist in North Korea and adhering to any religion is extremely dangerous that Joe found out for herself. One day she was taken to the local ministry of the state security without warning. There she was beaten, she was tor tortured, and she never did find out why she was there. Then the authorities placed Joe, or excuse me, uh, Jai's Bible on the desk in front of her. It was the Bible that her mother had and she brought it back to North uh, Korea after a trip to China. So Jai had begun to read that Bible. And sadly, her own friend had reported her to the government because she had a Bible. At the time, Jai was able to talk her way out of further punishment but she was informed she would not be forgiven if this happens again. And that was not Jai's last encounter to North Korean authorities. She man managed the difficult ex uh, escape from North Korea four times and was forcibly repatriated, repatriated back to North Korea by Chinese authorities three times. Forced labor and prison camps awaits for those who dare to leave the hermit kingdom. Twice in China, she was forced into prostitution. And during one reappination re to North Korea, she returned there pregnant because so-called mixed races, babies are not recognized in North Korea. Repatriated Deflectors who return pregnant endure brutal and heartbreaking forced abortions, and Joe was no exception. She continues to tell the story of how painful all this was. And she said, while well, people are dying and the rest of the world watches, if they maintain silence despite knowing what is going on, I don't think that that's right. We support missionaries that also are finding it very difficult to be a Christian. So we have much to be thankful for here. However, the same thing is happening in small groups, through, especially the Northeast uh, of our country. And we need to be in prayer for these people. And there's gonna be a day where we're gonna have to stand up and say something, or we're going to lose the opportunity to be here. It'll all be closed down, folks. So remember those things if you would. James and the rest of you. Boy, that was pretty depressing. <laughs> <laughs> would you stand as we sing praises to the Lord Jesus this morning? Closes 
risen Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world is all as it should be. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. And every blessing you out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose. Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Amen.
cross to the grave and from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds, by his wounds. What?
are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. In this place, mighty God, you are awesome. In this place, mighty God, you are awesome. In this place, mighty God. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for everything that you've given us, for the opportunity, Lord, to be able to gather here and worship and in praise this morning. Be with us now as we open your word, Lord. Help our minds and hearts to be fixed on you in thanksgiving and praise this morning. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Be seated if you would, please. Thank you, praise band. Well, we're in a series of messages titled, the names of God. And I pray that as we hear a new name and we still remember the old names, that we can grow closer to God than we were when we walked through those doors this morning. That's my prayer for you. We have all kinds of relationships in our lives. We have uh, relationships with our friends. We talk about dad, we talk about mom. We talk about papa, talk about pastor. Some of you express to your wife by saying, hi babe, no, nothing wrong with that, that's great. Some of us call our spouse or our kid sweetheart. And the more that I study the names of God, the more I see how a particular name, especially in biblical times, reflects the character of that individual that was just recently born. Folks, our God is so complex, no one can deny the fact that the name is not adequate to describe our Heavenly Father. We can have the names of a million different people and apply them to, to God and that's still not enough. So why is it important to know these names of God? Why study them? There are at least two reasons for that. As we learn the names by which God is known, we learn more about who he is. 
Knowing him by these names gives us an opportunity to have a closer relationship with him. Regardless of where you think you are spiritually, regardless of where you think you are in your relationship with him, we always need to increase our love for him. I've often said it, and I'm not so sure that it, there's anything that will give evidence from that, but I believe we worship God in the same way that we love our spouse. So if your love is not really what it should be for your spouse, that's the way you're going to love God. And that's what we need to learn to improve in our lives, not only our relationship with our spouse, but also with God. Every name of God that is new was a game changer for the Israelites. God would reveal a name which caused his people to react in an unusual way. Well, if that's who God is, and if that's what he does, with him I can get through this. I'd like to add through this coronavirus. We are gonna get through it, folks. It might take a little longer than we expected, but on the other side, we're gonna reflect upon that and see how good God has been to us. I can push through anything that I happen to be in, even though the odds are against me because with him, what's the scripture say? All things are possible through Christ our Lord. You might have remembered last Sunday, I mentioned to you that a new name is given to the Israelites, they learn a little more about him than they knew before. It was when they had their backs up against the wall, God would step in and reveal a new name for them so they could get through what they were going through at that time. And that's the way it should be with you and me. Trust in the Lord rest in the Lord, find peace in the Lord as we all go through this time. The name of God that we're going to look at this morning should bring us great comfort. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you and me. Being in the funeral business as I was for seven years with my dad and being a part of churches over the last years, there are people who wonder, well, why hasn't God healed me? Why hasn't God healed my loved one, my spouse, my, spouse your, my kids? What's the difference? Some are brought through it without much problems. Others who have the coronavirus have had it for months and they still have side effects. Why? Why is it God, you don't heal us as Christians? Well, here's the answer. God has a reason for it. It's not a cop-out. Unfortunately, we cannot see much of the picture that God sees. I mentioned last week, we only know a little bit. Why am I sick? Why am I the receiver of coronavirus. And God is the one who knows why. 
some people die from it. And if when they die, it kind of brings questions to our mind. God, where were you? Why did you let so-and-so die? Well, I can say this, and this is not a cop-out, I can say this, that a born-again Christian who knows Christ as his or her Savior, that when they die, they're going to heaven, and folks, it'll be far better for them than you and I here in the world. Think of that. That is a far greater place to be, heaven, than anywhere in this world. And those people who had died from the coronavirus, they're in heaven, they ain't got it anymore. They are perfect. Think of that. They are perfect. This coronavirus has caused many of us to have a one-track mind. And that isn't all your fault. Everything on TV, everything in the radio, everything in the newspaper and the magazines is what subject? Coronavirus. And if we don't watch ourselves, we'll get caught up in that as well. We can't think of anything else but the coronavirus. The question I have for you this morning is this. What do you want most out of life? Is it money and wealth? Is it popularity? Is it being influential with other people? Is it power? Is it health? Is it having a whole bunch of stuff in our lives? Which would you rather have? Which one would you want? Raise your hand and tell me. Health. How many would say health is the number one? Okay. James, I'm going to have you preach in three Sundays or so. You need to raise your hand. I don't want you getting sick, okay? <laughs> Health, folks, is the primary thing we should be considering in our lives. The Lord who heals you is the subject of this this morning. Do you realize that you are terminally ill? Me too. Every one of us is going to die. That's the truth. Wednesday night we got into a little discussion with the folks that were here for Wednesday night Bible study at 6.30. And I didn't say anything at the time, but come Wednesday night I'm going to deal with that and I wanted to be sure of my claims. So come and be with us Wednesday night as we talk about what we talked about as a group. It's kind of like the world turns, isn't it? You know, you know, all these places. We usually think that death will happen in the hospital or that somebody has been killed in a car accident. And that person too is terminally ill. Do you realize that all of us are in the process of dying? We are learning firsthand. The scientists are frantically searching for a vaccine that will protect us against the COVID-19. Here's the problem. Even though the drug companies have made great strides searching for a cure for some diseases, there are a lot of diseases 
we can't cure. Think of that. We cannot cure them. That's where we are with this coronavirus. A one-celled microorganism that multiplies itself a million times over in the body of the person who has it. This reminds me of a story of, of three sisters. One was 92, the next one was 94, and the next one was 96. They lived together for all of those years. One night, the 96-year-old woman was going to take a bath. She put her foot in the warm water of the bathtub and she stopped. She yelled down to her sister and she says, was I going up the stairs or was I going down the stairs? The 92 year old knew exactly what was going on. She was sitting in the kitchen and the 92 year old was having tea. And she was listening to her two sisters go back and forth, and she had a smirk on her face. She shook her head and said, I sure hope I never get that forgetful. And she knocked on wood just to be sure of it. Then she yelled, I come up and help both of you as soon as I find out who's at the door knocking. Boy, those are tough times, aren't they? <laughs> the reality is that Claudia and I are there. <laughs> oh, just me. Thanks, dear. <laughs> now I'm going to have to change the message. We're going to talk about spouses who give you a hard time. But this is where we are with this coronavirus, this one-celled uh, one microorganism. Do you realize that there are 37 miracles recorded in the New Testament that Jesus performed? 31 of them dealt with healing. From the blind to the sick, to the lame, the deaf, and the dying. The touch of Jesus changed their lives. And God is still, listen, God is still in the business of healing today. You say, well, I've been one God to change my problem for years. And again, I don't have the answer to that. But God does. I used to say, well, when you get to heaven, you can ask and find out. But guess what? When you get to heaven, folks, you don't care about anything that happened to you or your family that are still on the earth. God combined his name, Jehovah, with Rafi to reveal himself to us as our source of wholeness and our source for healing. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Any of you had one broken bone? Raise your hand. Oh, really? Okay. Have you broken more than one bone? All right. Have you had stitches? All right. Have you had more than 10 stitches? Oh my goodness. How many of you have had major surgery? Okay, some of you are in pretty bad shape. <laughs> Let me ask you now, who is the one who healed those things in your life that we talked about? Who is it? God, God. yeah. When you find yourself with broken bones or 10 stitches or more, how often or when did you go to God in prayer asking him, Lord, would you heal me of this? 
Now again, I have to tell you, it doesn't mean that God is going to answer that for you. We're going to talk about that. The Bible teaches us that God is still in the healing business. And he answers prayer. Now those of you who have been involved in the Tuesday morning prayer time, you've been able to see that the people you've been praying for have been healed. Their lives have been changed. That's exciting to see God work. My wife would come home and she would tell me that, oh, so-and-so has been cleared of this and so-and-so is much better than it was and seems to be all right. That's exciting. That's God working in their lives. You say, well, I had to go to a physician. Well, good. God was in that. God was in John. Excuse me for pointing. John is a physician. And those people are being used by God as an instrument of God's healing. Now, as we say those things, I want you to understand you can't blame God for these diseases and these troubles come along. Who can you believe? Fasi or whatever his name is. And Tells us one thing one month and something else the next month. But folks, this is serious business. And God uses specialists to do things to help his healing along. And you must always remember that you may not get the answer in this world. You will get it in heaven or you could care less. And that's what I go for. You could care less about, well, God, why didn't you heal me? God has a bigger picture in mind as to why that took place. So the Bible teaches us that God is still in the healing business and he does answer prayer. The first thing I want you to see, the scriptures tell us of many healings. I'll give you a couple of examples. Moses and the serpents. I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to Numbers. And chapter 21. And verses 4 through 9. How many of you like snakes? They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water. And we detest this miserable food. And the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on the top of the pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on the pole. Anyone who was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Now you gotta be kidding me. The snakes that bit them, venomous snakes that bit them they would kill you because of that bite. 
But if I came up to you and I said, you see the pole here? You see that snake up there made out of bronze? If you look at that, you'll be healed of the venom that's in your body. Oh, give me a break. You mean to tell me all I have to do is to look at that snake at the top of that pole and I'm going to be healed? Who said that? Moses said it, but who said it before Moses did? God. God did. Now, this illness was brought on because of disobedience, because of murmuring, and because of sin in their lives. This is not always the reason why we get sick or even die. These Jews became ill from a poisonous snake. Many did die. So God intervened and provided a way of healing. Provided a way of healing. There are three things that were required of them. Number one, it required obedience. Where is the obedience in this situation? Moses said, I, if you're bitten by a snake, all you have to do is look at that pole and the snake on top of it and you're healed. You have to be obedient to that or folks, you ain't gonna make it. Number two, humility. Humility. Not only should you be required to be obedient, but that takes a lot of humility to go up to that pole and see that bronze snake up at the top of it. You gotta be kidding me. You see, it takes a humble time for you to go and do that. Or it ain't gonna work. Number three, <laughs> repentance. Okay, repentance. Folks, you can do the first two, and if you miss on number three, it's still gonna work. God has a plan, and he wants you to fulfill the plan according to his requirements, not yours or mine. Now here's another guy. His name is Naaman. Naaman needed healing. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. I'm not going to turn there and go through that, but let me give you a synopsis here. Naaman was the commander of the army and was well respected inside of the king. But he had one problem. Naaman was a leper. Elisha, the prophet, heard that the king had torn his robes because of Naaman's leprosy. The king did that because of his general. Elisha told Naaman to go and wash himself seven times in the dirty, muddy Jordan River then his flesh would be restored. Naaman went away angry. Do you blame him? You see folks, what's happening here is that obedience is necessary, humility is necessary. So here is Naaman and he is a leper and that will one day kill him. And all he had to do was go into the Jordan River. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, that was the worst place to go if you ever want to be healed. But it took seven times for him to go in, go under, seven times. Go in, go under, go in, go under. And to look at it just in the face of what that means he said, you got to be kidding me. I'm not going to do that. That is ridiculous. Sometimes God wants us to do some ridiculous things in our lives. 
So Naaman went away angry, and his servants went with him, and they said this. These are servants now. If Elisha would have told you to do something great, would you not have done it? And I'm sure Naaman would have said, hey, listen, I'll do that because, boy, that is really something neat. I'll do that, but forget about washing in the Jordan River seven times. Seven times, Elisha said, and his flesh was restored. Naaman was an interesting example because guess what? He wasn't even Jewish. His sickness was not the result of sin, folks. So if you find somebody that's sick, hey, don't think in your mind, oh, that person has sin in his life. It was just a part of the general nature of being human. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have many healings recorded for us. Lepers were healed. A useless hand was restored. A woman's issue of blood was healed. Peter's mother-in-law was healed. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. The blind could see, the deaf could hear, and the lamb could, or the lame could walk again. Here's the second thing. The purpose of suffering. How many of you believe you, you have suffered? Just a couple of you? Okay, yeah. In 2 Corinthians, uh, that's in the New Testament, chapter 12, it says this. Verses 7 through 9. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these uh, surpassingly great revelation, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. The messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but he said, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. Ron and I said, you may never know the reason, and you may carry it for the rest of your life. That's God at work in your life. Teach what you know about the Word of God. So here's the guy, his name is Job. And his friends of God's greatness, that's what, that's what God wanted them to know. How great is our God? So the three friends and Job were really trying to figure out why is he going through all this suffering. And God allowed it to happen in his life because you remember in chapter 1 about the second, second verse, it says that Satan was talking to God. So it reveals God's glory and power to humble man and reveal our need for trust and faith in him. The New Testament uh, healing would confirm the gospel of salvation. In the New Testament, you would find that these men were, were humble because of what had happened to them. Paul's thorn was in the flesh. People suffered even back then, just like we do. And Paul is a good example. And Paul had a friend of his named Timothy. Timothy evidently had stomach problems. In 1 Timothy 5, 23, it says, stop drinking only water. 
and use a little wine because your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now, we have to get the whole picture here, and that is that water was kind of scarce back then in those places. And just about all Jewish homes, and probably the Gentiles as well, those homes had wine in it, but it was to be used for medical purposes. So Paul was used of God to heal many in a supernatural way. Yet he told Timothy, now get this, he told Timothy to use wine to correct his problem. That's one of these mysteries of the Word of God. Why some are healed and others are not. But prayer, listen, but prayer in any case is beneficial to the healing of the sick. Now, I'm a big believer in doctors. I'm a big believer in specialists and surgeons. However, I don't see them as the source of my healing, but as instrument of Jehovah Rafi used to bring healing. I get the place turned. So, what do we have here? Naaman's healing, the gospel. Lepers were healed. There was healing all over, folks. And that healing meant great things to those who had suffered all along. Now what do you do with this? I told you all of this so we get down to the nitty gritty. What do you do when you're hurting? hurting? Yeah, you pray. You may want to stay home because you hurt. The funny thing is, it's not funny, but the thing is, whether you're at home hurting, you could be at church and hurt just the same. But the hurting too often keeps you out of church. I had a fellow that was a motorcycle enthusiast. He was part of the Christian Motorcycle Association when I was the chaplain. And he came up to me and he said one day, he said, all you're interested in is numbers. And he used Hebrews 10.25 as the answer. And let me tell you, that boy was put in his place. Because I said Hebrews 10.25 is part of what? Paul's leadership as the Holy Spirit laid it on his hand to write that book. Folks, I'm not interested in numbers for numbers sake, but when I don't see you, I wonder. And that's why I called some of you. because I care about you. And I will pray for you. And many of you, uh, you and I have prayed on the telephone. I had a guy call me once, talk to him, and I say, here, let, let me pray with you. What? Let me pray with you. You gonna do that on the telephone? Yes. So what I'm telling you folks is, Trust in the Lord. Be faithful.
into your Christian life, into the Holy Spirit, to Christ the Son, and God the Heavenly Father. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Our Father, this message is one that is kind of difficult to grab hold of. But yet I thank you for what you gave to me, so I give it to these folks who are here today. Some may need healing. And they ought to come and just, just pray to you. There may be someone here this morning that does not know Christ at all. He or she is not sure that heaven is their home when they die and leave this earth. We can show them through the word of God, not our booklets and things like that, but through the word of God, how they can know you as their savior. So whatever their need is, Lord, today, I pray that they might come to be healed. But we also need to remember that you have a plan that may not be our plan. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, shall we, as we sing. And why don't you come this morning as God speaks to your heart. That you're in this place we thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you for the attention these folks gave to you. Father, dismiss us with your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you all. Our, our offering plates are on each side, okay?